X-Men 97 was everything that I hoped it would be. And buckle up, chaps, because we got a lot to talk about. And yes, we are going to address the ending of episode two at the end of this video, because I told you guys what was going to happen. Nobody wanted to believe me, but I told you who that was. So kicking things off here, this blonde chick who was part of the commission for superhuman activities, that's Valerie Cooper. She is hardcore in the comics. It's nuts. So as you guys could tell from the show, she was part of the commission on superhuman activities. What does that mean? Do you guys remember in Falcon and the Winter Soldier when Sam Wilson was fired as Captain America and replaced with John Walker, US agent? That was taken from Marvel Comics, except that in Marvel Comics, it was Steve Rogers who was fired and replaced with John Walker. That termination of Steve Rogers was done by Valerie Cooper and the Commission on Superhuman Activities because the argument was the federal government owned the ideology or the role character of Captain America. Steve Rogers was just borrowing it. John Walker went nuts, killed a bunch of people, and then Steve Rogers came back. But the Commission on Superhuman Activities is far-reaching. It does not just affect the X-Men. The only reason why you see it affecting the X-Men is because of the nature of the show. But it affects the Avengers, Fantastic Four, virtually any superhero team that existed out there. Now, the Commission has long since been defunct in Marvel Comics, but Valerie Cooper's role was not limited to the Commission on Superhuman Activities. It was also part of Project Wide Awake, and that was really her most significant role in Marvel Marvel Comics. What was Project Wide Awake? Project Wide Awake was amazing, right? It was this multi-level governmental initiative that spanned multiple presidencies and involved everybody. But it all actually started because of Adam Brashear, the Blue Marvel, but really kicked things off with Bolivar Trask and the early version of his Sentinel program. The idea behind this was that Bolivar Trask had long come to the realization that mutants appeared to be a credible threat in Marvel Comics. The government was aware of it, but they weren't really knowledgeable of how far reaching it was. When Adam Brashear, the Blue Marvel, showed up on the scene, just because of the high profile nature of his character and the events that transpired around the revelation of his origin story that Bolivar Trask had met with the government and said he may be one of these mutants and these mutants are a very dangerous thing. We need to work on containing and controlling. As a result, Project Wide Awake was born. And Project Wide Awake was exactly that, contain and control the mutant threat, police them, try to pass anti-mutant legislation if at all possible. This initiative started under the presidency of John F. Kennedy and then spanned multiple presidencies after that, Lyndon B. Johnson, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, so on and so forth. And then eventually it went defunct in the late 1980s. But Valerie Cooper's role was alongside Henry Peter Gyrick in the sense that they were the ones that kept tabs, right? Valerie Cooper's role within the Commission on Superhuman Activities use information from that group to feed into Project Wide Awake to kind of keep the government aware of what was going on with the mutant population as a whole. But that's the other thing that I want to talk about here, right? Bolivar Trask's Sentinels. So Bolivar Trask and his Sentinels that you saw here in X-Men 97 and in X-Men the Animated Series, that's not Bolivar Trask's Sentinels. That's actually the Sentinels of Stephen Lang. So what ended up happening is that as part of Project Wide Awake, Bolivar Trask made his move against the X-Men using his primitive Sentinels. Ultimately, he was defeated, and when he was, Project Wide Awake took his Sentinel program and handed it over to another guy named Stephen Lang. No relation to Scott Lang Ant-Man. What ended up happening here is under Stephen Lang, the Sentinels were restructured, revamped, and made far more dangerous than they had ever been before. Those are the Sentinels that you see in X-Men the Animated Series and X-Men 97. To his credit though, Bolivar Trask did come up with the wild Sentinels in the sense that these were literally robots that didn't require another robot to build them in a factory or a facility somewhere. They could just use any kind of technology around them regardless of what it was. Trees, buildings, steel, wood, whatever. They could use that to make themselves more capable, to make themselves stronger. They were highly adaptable. In fact, that's the next thing that I want to talk about here. The mutant nation of Genosha. So Genosha was at one point in Marvel Comics a home for like 16 million mutants. It was a safe haven. It was a way for the mutant population to walk away from humanity and live free from continued persecution until Cassandra Nova showed up. <laughs> because Cassandra Nova discovered the wild sentinels of Bolivar Trask. And this is how powerful these sentinels were. She sent 
three of them to Genosha. And within the span of hours, they eradicated 16 million mutants. It was crazy. It was covered in a story called ES4 Extinction, specifically New X-Men issues 114 to 117, for those of you guys who want to grab the comics. But let's talk about the ending of episode two, right? And let's talk about the idea of Jean having a baby. Because when the trailer dropped for X-Men 97, and they revealed that Jean Grey was pregnant, as most of you guys know who were following my channel at that point, I immediately came out and said, that's not Jean Grey, that's Madeline Pryor. Right now, how do I know that? Because in Marvel Comics, Madeline Pryor was the clone of Jean, and she's the person that Cyclops knocked up. Jean Grey and Cyclops have never actually had a child in the main Marvel Universe. They have in alternate realities, but never in the main Marvel Universe. So here's the way this worked. Do you remember in X-Men the Animated Series, the original OG X-Men the Animated Series, the villain Mr. Sinister, the guy with the diamond on his head, who was always trying to get Cyclops and Jean Grey to have a child. That's exactly how things worked in Marvel Comics. And that's because due to some time travel shenanigans that we don't need to go into here, Sinister very early on in his career, his life, had come across Cyclops and, and Jean Grey and realized that because of the nature of their powers, their DNA, their genes, what have you, if they ever had a child, their child would be godly powerful. And so because he could not easily capture Jean Grey and whenever he did, he could not initiate a coupling between herself and Cyclops, that what he did is he cloned Jean and he named the clone Madeline. Now this all took place during the original Phoenix and Dark Phoenix sagas in Marvel Comics. Why does that matter? Because during those stories, either Jean was too powerful to capture, especially in the Phoenix Saga, or in the Dark Phoenix Saga, she had lost her mind and was just deemed too mentally unstable. And so what had happened in Marvel Comics is that at the end of the Dark Phoenix Saga, when Jean Grey, quote unquote, sacrificed herself on the blue area of the moon, it led to a very small portion of the Phoenix Force within Jean to bond itself to Madeline. And it basically brought the clone to life and then imbued her with a very small portion of Jean Grey's powers. When Sinister realized this was the case, he realized that because of the fact that Cyclops was struggling with the death of Jean so much that he actually quit the X-Men, he sent Madeline out into the world, gave her an origin story, gave her fake memories, the whole nine yards. The Phoenix also gave her some of her memories as well. But what ends up happening here is that Madeline comes across Cyclops, and because of the fact that she looks exactly like Jean, Cyclops doesn't really care. He kind of questions it a little bit, but not enough for it to actually matter. Eventually, he rejoins the X-Men, and everything that you saw in the first two episodes of X-Men 97, where like you have the trial of Magneto, Cyclops is dealing with that, while Jean Grey is giving birth to their child, that's all from Madeline Pryor's story. Literally, shot for shot, Madeline Pryor's story in Marvel Comics. And so what ends up happening here is that Cyclops does retire for a time, but then Jean Grey comes back. And that's what I think is gonna happen here. I would not be surprised if in this X-Men 97, you see a cameo with the Fantastic Four. Marvel may not do it. It's entirely possible they may not do it, and it's most likely they won't do it. But why do I say that you would see a cameo from the Fantastic Four? Because in Marvel Comics, what you ended up having was a story in Fantastic Four, I want to say it's issue 286, but I'm not going to swear to that. Don't take that as gospel truth. But it was a story that basically explained Jean Grey's return after her death at the end of the Dark Phoenix Saga. That what ended up happening is the Fantastic Four found a cocoon in the bottom of Jamaica Bay. When they went there, they brought the cocoon back to the surface, cracked it open, and realized the real Jean Grey was inside. That Jean Grey as the Phoenix was never actually Jean Grey. It was just the Phoenix Force copying Jean Grey's appearance, but the real Jean Grey was just kept in stasis in the bottom of Jamaica Bay. What ended up happening is the X-Men were alerted to that, and then Cyclops was told while he was retired with Madeline Pryor and Nathan. Cyclops goes to visit Jean, sees it's actually her, and then abandons Madeline and his child. Literally, he's just a father who abandoned his family and then reconciles everything with Gene and goes forward on a team called X-Factor. As you guys can tell, there's huge differences between what happened in the comics and what's happened in X-Men the Animated Series and in X-Men 97 so far. Most notably, the fact that Jean Grey at the end of the Dark Phoenix Saga in X-Men the Animated Series, she didn't die. Right, she was more, I mean, she did, but she was basically resurrected through a combination of the Phoenix Force and the X-Men and just kind of went forward from there. So it's not as though she's been gone this whole time. Another huge difference here is that Jean Grey shows up at the Xavier Institute 
while Madeline Pryor's there. That doesn't really happen in Marvel Comics. So they've changed quite a bit here. If I'm a betting man, I would say that all of this is a scheme by Mr. Sinister because his story is inexorably tied to Madeline Pryor. He's the one that created her. He's the reason why she exists. And so Sinister will likely be revealed as the person who created Madeline. It'll be a kind of head game type manipulation that goes on between Jean Grey and Madeline and Cyclops, where it's like, well, I'm the real one. No, I'm the real one. And it just kind of turns into a two-person variation of the Spider-Man meme where they're pointing at each other, right? So ultimately, it'll be revealed that the Jean Grey who gave birth to Nathan Summers that that's Madeline, because in the comics, that's exactly what happened, right? That Nathan goes on to become Cable and this ridiculously overpowered mutant and so on and so forth. And then ultimately Cyclops will choose the real Jean Grey over Madeline. And if the rumors are true, that'll lead to Madeline Pryor just being eight kinds of pissed off and ultimately initiating the Inferno storyline. Now, I would say that in X-Men 97, unlike the events of Marvel Comics, where she like sells her soul to demons and stuff like that, I don't see X-Men 97 doing that. <laughs> because this show is geared as much to children as it is to adults through nostalgia. And so what I would say is going to happen here is that the origin story of Madeline and Marvel Comics will almost be identical in terms of how she was quote unquote activated or woken up, meaning a portion of the Phoenix Force resides within Madeline. And that's where her powers come from. The depowering of Storm, that's basically establishing mutants can lose their powers, right? That'll be a major plot point for Madeline, I think. And what's going to happen here is that because all of Madeline's abilities are tied to the Phoenix Force, you're going to see a kind of repeat of the Dark Phoenix Saga. That Madeline is going to reappear, you're going to get the Inferno event, but it's basically going to be the Dark Phoenix Saga centering on Madeline, but with a different name. And that's it, right? Madeline's just going to be eight kinds of pissed off. She's mad because Cyclops bailed on her and the child, he ends up going with Jean Grey instead. Something's gonna happen with Nathan, and then the events of Inferno, basically Dark Phoenix, are going to play out. What that looks like, I have no idea, but that's my guess, right? That's my bet on how all this transpires. But let me know what you guys think down in the comments section. Is there anyone or anything you want me to explain in greater detail in future videos? And I will catch you all later. Peace.